In other news, Singapore reported 386 new COVID-19 cases yesterday, our highest spike in a single day so far. We are approaching 3,000 cases with the current total at 2,918. The Health Ministry also confirmed yesterday that a ninth person has died from the virus, a 65-year-old Singaporean man. Four new clusters were also identified yesterday, including two dormitories. Singapore's largest cluster, the S11 dormitory at Pongol, added 222 more cases. 586 cases have now been linked to that cluster. Vanguard Healthcare's Woodlands Care Home and Number 2 Woodlands Rise is the second nursing home here to have a confirmed case. A 77-year-old male resident was confirmed to have the virus yesterday. Meanwhile, the Singapore Police Force debunked claims that the police had stopped and fined motorists at roadblocks for not complying with the enhanced safe distancing measures. In a media statement, the police added that roadblocks are conducted to detect offences like drink driving and for other law enforcement purposes. But the spokesman said the police may take enforcement action if they come across motorists and passengers flouting safe distancing measures when conducting roadblocks. Schools have been allowed to progressively resume the use of video conferencing platform Zoom for home-based learning with additional safeguards in place. The Education Ministry introduced three additional layers of defence, including an all-compensating security button that consolidates the conferencing platform's security features. And good news, today Singaporeans will start receiving their $600 payout under the Solidarity Package. Depending on their income, those eligible will receive an additional $300 or $600 in June. And many ATMs across Singapore will be covered with an antimicrobial coating as banks seek to assure Singaporeans that it's safe to withdraw from the machines. Now let's turn our attention to unlinked cases here in Singapore. According to the latest situation report by the Health Ministry, a total of 312 cases have been classified as unlinked. And to take this discussion further, we welcome back Professor Tio Yik Ying, Dean of the Saw Sui Hock School of Public Health at the National University of Singapore. Good to see you again, Prof. So from March 30th until this past Sunday, 205 local cases were detected and they are still being investigated for links. What are the possible factors behind this alarming increase in unlinked cases, Prof? So thank you for having me. There are two possible reasons that could explain the rise in the number of unlinked cases. The first is that there are genuinely more unlinked cases in the community and clearly this will be worrying because it means that there are places out in the public where people are getting exposed and infected, but yet it is not possible to pinpoint the source, where these places are, or who are the people that could have spread the virus. That's the first reason. The second reason is actually more logistical. It takes a lot of effort to perform the contact tracing and to establish the links with existing cases. As there are more cases now, you can think of it as the database of known cases is actually growing and every new case now has to match against this much larger database and that mm. takes time. Also, as there are more cases being reported every day, there is an upper limit to how many cases they can possibly work on for each day, even though the number of teams that are performing the contact tracing has increased. When the number of daily new cases is low, the contact tracing teams can perform a much deeper investigation and surveillance. Mm. Prof, uh, imported cases are dropping. Now, zero have been reported since April 10th. All returning travellers have to serve their 14-day stay-home notice at government facilities now, and this has helped to cut off transmission from that source. Now, when it comes to local transmissions, linked and unlinked, what is key in bringing that figure down? Well, there are now two fronts that Singapore is fighting this battle against COVID-19. The first is the community front, where the majority of the infections happen in homes, in public spaces, and in workplaces. The circuit breaker measures to close schools and workplaces, as well as to minimize movement out in the community, will significantly reduce this community transmission. Already, we can see that there are much less people on the streets 
and in public spaces now, and the level of human-to-human -human interactions has decreased tremendously. I'm actually optimistic that this front will start to show very encouraging results in the next 10 to 14 days, provided everyone cooperates and stay at home except absolutely necessary. So there is still a need for all of us to play our part to stay home, be mindful of personal hygiene, and to act responsibly. Practice safe distancing and preferably wear a mask when we really need to be outside. Mm. The second front is actually much more worrying, and I'm referring to the outbreak that we're seeing in the dormitories and construction sites involving mm. mostly the foreign migrant workers. I would actually label the situation in some of the worst affected dormitories as widespread transmission. And several of these dormitories house thousands of foreign workers. Mm -hmm. Measures have been put in place to segregate these workers into multiple locations, including floating hotels, army camps, unused HDB blocks, and I believe these measures will help. But over the next one to two weeks, I expect there will be increasing number of foreign workers that test positive for the coronavirus before we start to see the effects of these measures taken. Mm -hmm. So my estimate is that we will need at least another three to four weeks before we start to see the situation in the dormitories improve. But this does not mean that the measures taken are not effective. It just means that the situation involving the dormitories need more time because of the larger number of people involved. Well, Prof, experts say that asymptomatic infections would also contribute to the rise in unlinked cases. One expert pointed to the studies done in the US, China and Italy, which showed that more than half to about 70% of those with COVID-19 are either asymptomatic or have minimal uh, symptoms. But they can share the virus for up to four weeks. Should this change um, how we've been battling the virus, all the safe distancing measures that we've been taking? I don't think this knowledge of asymptomatic spread or virus shedding, the period of virus shedding, changed what we have been saying all along, which comes back to safe distancing, practice personal hygiene, and now wear a mask when you're outside. It still boils down to how an infected person actually leaves viruses on surfaces, coughs or sneezes openly and irresponsibly, and how we interact with one another, all of this that matters. Our social norms have changed quite a lot in the past three months. We have stopped shaking hands with one another. This helps to minimize contact and thus the spread. We adopted the practice of washing our hands very frequently with soap and water. This reduces the chance that if I touch any surface and end up transferring the virus from the surface to my hand and then to my face. We now stand preferably one to two meters apart from each other. And this again minimizes any aerosols particles when we speak to get onto each other. And now with the strong recommendation of mask wearing, we further reduce the chance that our droplets from talking, coughing or sneezing contaminates any surface or any person nearby. So all of this will help. And, and I see that these are the same recommendations that governments worldwide have been giving to their people. So it's not going to change with this additional knowledge on asymptomatic transmission or viral shedding. Mm. Prof, uh, let's take a, take a look at how we've done so far. Now, more than 200 composition fines of $300 each were issued yesterday to those who flouted elevated safe distancing measures. Plus, we just saw a national record of 386 new cases. How do you think the first week of the circuit breaker went? Well, it takes time for people to get used to what is acceptable and what isn't. The first few days of the circuit breaker, enforcement officers have to remind people subsequently to warn people that what they're doing, such as gathering at void decks, having people from different households come together for sports or for food, those activities are not acceptable. There have been plenty of warnings given before we start to issue stricter penalties, such as the fines. But overall, I think you could say that clearly the human traffic has dropped tremendously. We see this in the roads, we see this in public spaces. The majority of people have listened to the call to stay home and to minimize interactions. We know this will have a positive impact to containing the outbreak in Singapore. And based on the numbers we are seeing for domestic transmission, if we exclude the foreign workers, they are actually very encouraging signs here. But it is important at this point to highlight 
we really cannot afford to be overconfident and to prematurely declare victory over the outbreak, even if we start to see only very few community cases near the end or after the circuit breaker. We must continue to remain vigilant. The situation can return and worsen, just as it did in the middle of March for us in Singapore. Hmm. Well, fantastic point, uh, Professor. So considering the rise in unlinked cases and what you've told us about asymptomatic, asymptomatic cases, do you think the circuit breaker then should be in place beyond uh, May the 4th? Well, m my personal take is that the domestic situation outside the dormitories will likely improve over the next one to two weeks. But the situation with our foreign workers will actually get worse, perhaps only improving three, four weeks later. Now, if that is indeed true, then it may be prudent to extend the circuit breaker perhaps by another two weeks until 18th of May, because the last thing we want is to prematurely relax the measures only for the local situation to worsen again. A two-week extension may cause additional economic hardship for many people, but it will still be better than having to implement another four to six weeks of circuit breaker very soon after this current uh, period. Mm. By carefully exploring the situation, perhaps guided by data and evidence from mathematical models, from knowing where the new cases are from in, in the last week just before the 4th of May, the government will be able to make a more informed decision whether the 4th of May is a realistic target or perhaps we should choose to be prudent and opt for an extension. Hmm. Well, thank you very much for your time, Professor Chiu. It's been a pleasure as always. We've been speaking to Professor Chiu Yeking, Dean of the Sorcery Hawk School of Public Health at NUS. And I believe the take-home message here is to stay at home unless absolutely necessary.